The Earth is wounded, and humans are largely responsible for the pain. With our rapid scientific advancement, however, we're coming up with solutions to heal our ailing planet. We're even thinking about colonizing outside of our home atmosphere. Make sure you stick around till the end to learn how space colonization could result in a new species of human. If this is your first time visiting our channel, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe. Today, we are showing you what would happen if humans lived in space. Terraforming Mars or the Moon When you think of humans making colonies in space, your first thought is probably that we can develop habitats on the Moon or Mars. This is something that scientists and entrepreneurs are talking about today with such frequency that it seems possible in the future. The act of colonizing a foreign celestial body such as the Moon or Mars would require that we terraform the surface of the planet. Terraforming is the act of changing the physical properties of a planet, such as modifying the atmosphere and temperature, so that the planet can be Earth-like and thus habitable. Mars is the most ideal candidate for terraforming because it already meets all the criteria that are needed for life as we know it to exist. There is water, possibly frozen at the polar ice caps, carbon and oxygen in the form of carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. Additionally, Mars is the second closest planet to our Earth. While Venus is closer and potentially easier to access, she is also a fiery storm of carbon dioxide, high wind speeds, and pockets of sulfuric acid in the form of clouds. Venus is far too violent and hot, the hottest planet in the solar system to be habitable or considered for terraforming. The Moon doesn't meet the necessary criteria, such as having the crucial elements like carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, so while it's closer than Mars, it could be more challenging and more expensive to terraform. Warming the planet So, out of the candidates, we've chosen our planet. Mars. With a rotation rate and axial tilt extremely close to those of the Earth, this planet would be our best option. Additionally, the strength of gravity on Mars is only one-third of that on Earth, and Mars is still close enough to the Sun to experience seasons. Perfect! So what's the next step in terraforming the red planet? The first phase, and the least time-consuming, would be to warm the planet comfortable with Earth-like temperatures. Currently, Mars's average temperature is negative 60 degrees Celsius or negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit. We would want to bring it up so that the average temperature would be close to Earth's average temperature, which is 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Modern Mars has a similar atmospheric makeup to early Earth, which is pretty good news for us. If early Earth's carbon dioxide-rich atmosphere could be transformed into breathable air, we could do the same to Mars. The red planet currently has an atmosphere of 95.3% CO2. If we could repeat the process that happened on Earth many eons ago, we would thicken the atmosphere and create a greenhouse effect, which would result in the warming of the planet to more habitable temperatures. This warming period would be relatively easy and the whole process could take around 100 years. The Oxygenation Phase Great, it's only been 100 years, and now we have a planet with a similar atmospheric thickness and average surface temperature to those of Earth. Next, we need breathable air so humans and other earthly creatures can survive. Unfortunately, this is an immense task that could take thousands of millennia. That doesn't mean scientists have given up, though. They are constantly proposing new ideas and technologies that could potentially speed up the process. For example, scientists have developed what is essentially an oxygen factory that can be used on Mars. It's a machine powered by solar energy that extracts pure oxygen from carbon dioxide that is abundantly present in Mars' thin atmosphere. Currently a prototype, it's called Mars In-Situ Propellant Production Precursor, and it's significant because it could only potentially be used to fuel a return flight from the red planet to terra firmer by mixing oxygen with rocket fuel. Another solution that is ideologically simpler but in practice a bit more complex is to just introduce plants to Martian soil. Plants are photosynthesizers, meaning they take sunlight, convert it to energy for their use, and produce oxygen as a byproduct. Simple enough, except that planets as we know them need warmth and hospitable soil. We would need to bring bacteria that produces ammonia as a byproduct to the Martian soil so that they could take nitrogen from the atmosphere to accommodate large plants like grasses and mosses, a process that could take hundreds of years. Providing protection from solar wind now that we've warmed the red planet and made its air breathable, we can start sending humans there, right? Not quite. 
Our home planet Earth has this incredible region of space surrounding it in which the dominant magnetic field is actually that of Earth rather than that of interplanetary space. We call it the magnetosphere. And this region acts like a shield from solar winds that send charged particles and deadly radiation our way. Current science suggests that Mars used to have a magnetic field much like our own, protecting its atmosphere and giving the planet a chance to be warm, wet, and hospitable, but it disappeared 4.2 billion years ago. The Martian atmosphere was then totally exposed to solar wind and essentially blew away, leaving behind a frail, thin layer that left the planet cold and inhabitable. To combat this issue, NASA has actually proposed sending a magnetic field to Mars that could protect its atmosphere and give the planet a chance of flourishing again, or at least facilitate manned missions to the Martian surface. Many magnetospheres might be the solution. The shield could be placed at L1, one of the five gravitationally stable points relative to Mars and the Sun in orbital mechanics. It would stay in position and provide a tail of protection for Mars to avoid being buffeted by solar winds. Muscular Atrophy Amazing! We've completed terraformed Mars and turned it into a planet suitable for humans and other earthly life to settle on. So what exactly are the consequences of living on a different celestial body? The severity of the effects would differ between Mars, the Moon, or even space colonies orbiting or surrounding the planet. Let's talk about what happens to astronauts living on the International Space Station. These scientists are not exactly in zero-g, like they would be in space because the ISS is in low Earth orbit. It orbits the planet at just the right rate, such that the astronauts aboard are in a constant state of freefall, which Albert Einstein posited is indistinguishable from a zero-g environment, otherwise known to be an environment not affected by acceleration due to gravity. This is known as the equivalence principle in the theory of general relativity. This has serious consequences on the human body, since our bodies evolved on a planet whose gravity was putting a constant stress on them. In zero-g environments, or environments with a smaller acceleration due to gravity, like the Moon or Mars, our muscles don't have to work as hard. Thus, they begin to atrophy or waste away. Our heart shrinks and our neck and calf muscles are especially affected. If we lived in a lower gravity environment, our bodies would radically change and adapt to the new challenges of our new home. The best adapted traits would survive and be passed on to our offspring. Bone density would decrease. In addition to muscular atrophy, lower or zero-g environments would also affect your bones. This is because they're not experiencing the same weight or loads on them every day like they would under Earth's gravity. Thus, the bone tissue is absorbed into the bone, but it's not rebuilt, resulting in weaker bones that are less dense, more frail, and easier to fracture. Another issue with bone tissue being absorbed in space is that it can find itself in the kidneys, building up there and leading to kidney stones. NASA researched the effects of zero-g on the skeleton, and they found that bone density drops at a rate of about 1% per month. This is an extremely high rate for healthy adults. For comparison, the average rate of bone density density decrease in elderly people is 1% to 1.5% per year. The Moon has a gravitational pull that is only about 16.6% that of Earth's, and on Mars, that number is around 38%. These environments would be a little bit friendlier to our muscles and bones than living in space in zero-g, but would still have a great impact on our bodies and potentially even our genes. Humanity would need to adapt to lower gravity if we want to live on Mars or the Moon, or find a scientist solution to build a habitat that could replicate Earth's gravity. Normal blood flow would change. There is still one more consequence of living in lower gravity environments than Earth. This one has to do with the way our blood flows. Again, because our bodies evolved to tolerate the stresses and sometimes the aid of gravity, our circulatory system has a difficult time functioning properly in lower G environments. Normally, gravity assists our circulation by pulling blood down to our legs. When gravity is absent or significantly weaker, our bodies strain to move our blood and fluids as efficiently. On Earth, there's a nice equilibrium between work done by our body and work done by gravity. In space, this workload is nearly doubled, and our bodies can't keep up. 
Consequently, blood tends to pool in our heads. This effect was observed by NASA on an astronaut named Scott Kelly, who spent 11 months aboard the ISS and was selected due to his veteran spacefaring experience. Over the duration of his stay in space, NASA observed that the fluid moving into Kelly's head was enough to fill a 2-liter soda bottle. This is significant because it puts more pressure in the head and even puts more pressure on the optic nerve. This can cause vision problems in space that usually dissipate once back on Earth but would remain a problem if humans were to live in space. Radiation Exposure one of the more serious consequences of living in space, be it on a new celestial body or in a space station orbiting the Earth, is exposure to several types of radiation. Galactic cosmic radiation, solar radiation, solar winds of changed particles, and even geomagnetically bound radiation all pose a threat to any humans wishing to live in space. According to NASA, astronauts on the space station can be bombarded by over 10 times the radiation they would experience on Earth. This paves the way for a multitude of health problems as radiation damages the cells in our body. Long-term exposure can lead us to develop cancers, cataracts, and other degenerative tissue diseases, behavioral problems, reduced cognitive function, and more. In order to live in space, we would need extremely effective shielding from all the types of radiation that would be flying our way in order to remain safe and healthy, enough to live long and produce viable offspring without genetic mutations. The exposure to these types types of radiation is so prominent in space that astronauts have purportedly even seen bright flashes when they close their eyes, a result of cosmic radiation hitting and stimulating the optic nerve, the same way that we can see electromagnetic radiation in the visible spectrum, otherwise known as a visible light, also hits our optic nerves. Space Habitats if Mars or the Moon are a little too far of a goal for the future of space colonization, there is a third option for humanity. We could build space colonies in space stations, either orbiting the Earth or completely surrounding it, though the latter would be certainly more expensive. In order to eliminate or at least reduce the effects of zero-g on future space colonists, the orbiting habitats would be rotated to provide a little bit of stimulated gravity thanks to Newton's first law of motion, relating to bodies at rest or in same directional motion and their tendency to keep the same state unless acted upon by an external force. In this case, the spinning habitat would cause our bodies to move, but the floors of the ship would force our bodies to move in a circular path. Our bodies would want to continue in one directional motion, however, which results in being pushed against the floor. Spin the habitat faster and the effect is greater. These space stations would also need some pretty strong radiation shielding for their inhabitants. This would probably mean no windows on the habitat, because usually the transparent material used to make space station windows doesn't act like a powerful enough shield against all types of radiation. Some habitats would be practical in a similar manner to how the moon would be practical. In that, we wouldn't have to be so far away from home. Speciation could occur. Exposure to radiation, bone degeneration, muscular atrophy, learning to move in low-gravity environments, all of these effects of living in space could play a role in the future of the human species. Loads of sci-fi authors and directors have toyed with the implications of a new environment for humans. On Earth, as environments change, species must change and adapt to continue to not only survive, but also to thrive. This is the concept behind evolution. So what might happen if we send people to colonize space? Be it on Mars, the Moon, or space stations, all of the new environmental factors of living off Earth and remaining isolated from Earthly humans could result in speciation. The of a new species forming to adapt to new habitat conditions. Some humans in these colonies might be genetically predisposed to having a lower risk of medical complications due to radiation exposure. For example, they would need to procreate, passing on their genes, and after a few generations, the colonies would wind up with a potentially new species of human that is resistant to radiation. Whether or not this would actually happen is currently all speculation and thought experiment. We really have no idea what would happen to isolated communities of space colonists in terms of speciation. But given the basic principle of evolution, it seems feasible enough. If anything, it's a really neat concept to think about and makes for great movies and TV shows. Would you like to live in space? Don't be shy to answer in the comment section down below. We'd love to hear what you think. And that wraps it up for what would happen if humans lived in space. If you like speculating the consequences of hypothetical situations, make sure to check out what would happen if all sharks went extinct. Thanks for watching and see you next time.